take this theory that I've been working on, I'll try to break it down into the easiest um, uh, way to uh, get from point A to point B. Um, and it's loud enough, right? You can hear me okay? Okay. Uh, I first began working on brand names in the late 1990s, around um, 1995, roughly. And I've been working on them continuously since then. Uh, what attracted me to working on brand names was I'm also a writer, okay? I've written for magazines and newspapers, and I used to subscribe to a magazine uh, for writers. And in that magazine, there were these advertisements. And they're not your standard advertisements. They're ad advertisements that are called trademark education ads. And they were created by companies like Xerox, and Kleenex, and Mace, and Daglo, and um, other companies to protect their brand names and to convince editors and writers to stop using brand names generically. And what do I mean by a generic brand name? Okay. Um, I've noticed in Romania, uh, traveling around Romania the past week, I've noticed that um, it's a shock. <laughs> Yeah. 
Uh, the company behind Kleenex is a company called Kimberly Clark. That's the company behind it. But Kleenex is a brand. And as a brand, it's got to be registered as a proper adjective. Okay? And that means if it's a proper adjective, something has to follow it, and it's going to be a common noun phrase. Um, in this case, it's tissues. Tissues representing the semantic class to which that product belongs. And this semantic class is not finite, okay? It's not limited, uh, because we have to be able to account for technological advances, innovations in uh, everything that we see around us. So there are always, every day, there are, there are new semantic classes being registered, okay? And so this gives us a common option to put it as a CM. Uh, and I've been traveling all over the world, and every country I've run into so far has run a similar pattern to this. Uh, I was in Laos, and I was taking pictures of the billboards to analyze the names and how they're constructed and looking at them. Uh, but we have this protection. And this allows for a degree of protection, and it standardizes everything so that uh, the companies producing the brands can try to protect their brand name. But the first problem we run into is where does the money go? When you advertise a brand name, where does the money go? It, does it go into this or does it go into this? It goes into this, right? So when you look at your products and you take a look at, at, at your products, I haven't looked at the bottom of the water yet, but you'll see it's Dorna and then there's the registered trademark. And at some point down here it says, um, Aparopinarada naturala. <laughs> Sorry about my Romanian, but carbonated natural mineral water. Okay, which would probably be the class that it probably belongs to. Okay. Uh, my first sentence in Romanian yesterday was at the Cluj, the Boca train station, when I bought a bottle of mineral water from the kiosk. And I sent it to her in, in Romanian, and she kind of laughed at me and <laughs> brought me a little bottle, and I said, oh, big bottle. Um, so, uh, we see this again and again and again, and this, looking at these, I started to wonder about the trademark education campaigns. Um, and in those trademark education ads that I talked about a few minutes ago, they were calling it misuse. Use of the generic form as misuse. And I have a, a serious problem with that because I'm basically a descriptivist. And I believe in the descriptive side of language, the side that says, well, yes, we have rules to the language, but I'm much more interested in how people are actually using the language. So how could it be misused <coughs> if they're, what they're doing is not misusing the language, they're reappropriating the language. They're finding an additional use for the language. And then, of course, you bring up the old concepts of grammaticality and acceptability. Is it grammatical the way that they're using it? Is it grammatical to use Xerox as a verb? Yeah. Representing an action. <clears throat> Is it acceptable to a native speaker to be able to use it that way? Certainly. So how can this be misused? And I was walking across campus at Cambridge one day, uh, where, I was, uh, where I had started my doctorate before eventually leaving to go to Hawaii to complete it. And it started coming to me in my head. I started running the changes, started thinking about these changes in my head, and I thought, I think I can explain this. I think I can explain these changes. And to this point in linguistics, at that point, which was in the late 90s, no one had attempted to explain what was going on here. What the literature had said, and the literature was very sparse, there were very few things written about generic brand names. And what was written were usually just a few sentences. These are random changes. Um, we don't know what's going on here. They're not really that interesting in linguistics because they're probably more towards marketing or some other aspect. And I decided I was going to set out to figure this problem out. And I had a specific problem in mind that I wanted to also address, which was something I knew from language change, which was an issue of actuation. Have you heard about the actuation problem? No, I don't know. Okay, the actuation problem is how does the change, how does, how do changes begin? Okay, and the problem that we have in language, um, if you look at um, language history, 
is that with English words, for example, we can look at the Oxford English Dictionary for the earliest citing, the earliest known reference to that usage of that word. But that doesn't mean that's actually when the word came into language. That's just the earliest visible form that we have of language. But what brand names allow us to do is we, they allow us to see a visual, vi uh, visible actuation date because we have the date of registration. So if we have the date of registration, which is quite unique in language, and we know when they started advertising and marketing this product, then we can see where the changes began. And we might be able to at least give some clues to how the actuation problem began. And the actuation problem in linguistics goes back to about 1968. Um, I have the citation uh, somewhere here. Yeah, here it is. It's from Weinreich, Lebov, and Herzog, 1968. And it says, the overall process of linguistic change may involve stimuli and constraints both from society and from the structure of language. The difficulty of the actuation riddle is evident from the number of factors which influence change. It is likely that all explanations to be advanced in the near future will be after the fact. Okay? And I found that quite interesting. Because if we have the actuation dates and brand names, we may be able to see A, when they came into language, and two, knowing what we have in the rest of the theory, which I'm going to talk about, we may have the ability to predict genericization. And that would be a fairly unique thing in, in language, to be able to predict the change before the change happens. So um, that's the side of it that I'm working on right now, is, is this predictability. Whether this predictability is actually possible or not. Okay, and I'm going to explain the hypotheses behind this, and then you'll see why it might be possible. Um, using Google as, a good, as the example for this. Okay, uh, Google came out after I first started working on this theory, and it provides a unique um, perspective. But <clears throat> so, getting back to the legal status, we have the brand names uh, as proper adjectives followed by common nouns. So that gives us a starting point. To when I did the original study, I created, I did it through a corpus, and I created a, a corpus of 100 brand names that were believed to be generic. And to test whether they were generic or not, I did a two-token test. And I looked for uh, two tokens of each of those brand names in generic use from unedited sources, mainly from blogs people's personal blogs because they're unedited and they would give me the information I'm looking for. And this was also fairly early in internet development, so people were really, really heavily blogging, and there was a lot more information uh, of that kind uh, before people started losing their audiences to Twitter and to Facebook and social networking services. Um, <clears throat> so once I had the uh, corpus completed, the 100 brand names uh, with two tokens each, um, I began to start putting together uh, what was going on. And I had four hypotheses that I was working with. Okay. The first hypothesis was the hypothesis of novelty. And it stated that for a brand name to become generic, it had to represent something that was novel or innovative, <coughs> something that didn't exist previously. Okay. And we see this again and again and again. Um, with Xerox, does anyone know what was prior to Xerox? What did we use 30, 30, 40 years ago? I don't know what the machine, but I found this. It made these blue prints. Yes. It was called a mimeograph. Um, a mimeograph machine. And even at that time, mimeograph was a generic. Okay. Um, so Xerox came along, and as the first real photocopier service, it was an innovation that created this form. And of course, if you're the earliest form out there, people are only going to know you by uh, your service. So of course, we had Xerox. Photocopiers. The extension is made later to the copying process itself. But we had Xerox photocopiers. All of the advertising goes into this name. Just because.
becomes functional in zero. Because it doesn't really exist. It exists on paper, but it's, it's even if you look at the marketing materials, you'll see Xerox in 24 point font, and you'll see photocopier in 8. Okay, the intention is going to there, so this becomes a function of zero. This makes the jump almost instantaneously. Okay, as soon as the product starts gaining some marketing success, right? And so Xerox becomes here, and as I'll explain later, you'll get majuscule drop and you get other things happening. Okay? So if it represents something new, something innovative, and of course it's successful, becoming the primary uh, form in this category, it'll make that jump. Okay? We've seen this with Sony Walkman, we've seen this with Velcro, we've seen it with Mace, the stuff that police spray in people's eyes. We've seen it hundreds of cases. There's lots and lots of these. Okay? That was a fairly easy one to figure out. Okay? It didn't take much effort uh, to figure that out. The second hypothesis I was working with had to do with the length of the common class noun phrases. And this is something that even the industry didn't realize at the time, and the industry, I hope, has started addressing the problem. Because, uh, let's look at Velcro. You know Velcro, the sticky tape that you put on your shoes and stuff? Okay. Uh, when Velcro was developed, do any of you, can, can any of you guess what the noun phrase that it was registered with is? The semantic class. Well, something. Yeah, it came from French, the word crochet. So it's a blended term. Okay, sure. Word? But what, what would this be? A noun, I would say. register as the common class noun uh, phrase. Um, Something so silly, I don't think you could imagine how silly it is. It was 2.6 syllables. 
to 4.4 syllables. And at the morphine level, it was 2.1 to 3.2. So at every level, the brand names that had become generic were all shorter and in most cases easier to articulate than the class noun phrase that they belong to. Okay, are we good so far? Yeah. Okay, we have any fun yet? <laughs> okay, um, I'm, I'm afraid you're going to learn more about brand names today than you probably ever wanted to know about brand names. You'll probably never look at them the same way again. When you're sitting at, the, at, at breakfast in the morning, you'll be looking at the brand names, thinking about them at this time also. The uh, third hypothesis, the third hypothesis I was working with was that there's nothing random about these changes, that these are regular changes, and that we can demonstrate the change from um, the registered brand all the way through the generic process, the process of genericization, and we can represent that. And I'll show you how that, that goes after I get to the fourth uh, and final hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> When I got to the last problem, the last problem took me a little while to figure out what, what is it that um, allows some brand names to become generic, but not others. Okay? There was something I was missing. And I can remember sitting in class, in a class completely unrelated. Uh, it was Japanese anthropology. Uh, and I was sitting there and I was working with the theory and working with the brand names and playing with them, trying to figure out what was going on. What am I missing? There was something I was missing. And what I was missing was what I ended up calling the single association hypothesis. For a brand name to become generic, it has to represent a single item. It can't represent across classes. Okay. So what we get in all of these cases, and looking at the brand names, and when it hits you, it's like, whoa, there it is. Okay, Xerox, Velcro, Mace, they all represent a single, single item. Okay, but you take, for example, fashion house brands. Um, take Chanel, take um, Kenzo, take any of the brands, and they represent shoes and accessories and clothing, and they do all these different lines. There's nothing, you can't attach a single, a uh, single, uh, yeah, you can't make that, that semantic connection there. That would give us that one meaning that would allow it to become generic. And that was the single association hypothesis uh, for that. And that was the missing part of the puzzle. And then, uh, from that step, okay. I'm going to keep an eye on the clock. Um, it's not that I'm trying to run away, it's that I want to get to about 11.05, 11.10, so I can open it up for questions. Um, so I'll give some time for questions. Um, can I erase this? Okay. I made the mistake the other day uh, giving a lecture in southern Ukraine, and they had two whiteboards that looked similar. And I was writing, and I went across to the second one, and I was just about to write, and I could see panic in the faces of everybody. Because it wasn't a whiteboard, it was a screen. <laughs> I almost, almost started to write on the screen. They looked identical. So, from now on, I'll be very careful uh, about where I write. Um, now, how does all of this happen? How does it happen that we go from a proper adjective and a counting noun down to a generic form? And eventually, if it represents an action in generic verb. Um, well, we have to break apart first writing versus speaking because we have a, a, a difference in the charts that uh, we can't see when we're talking about speaking that we can see when we're in, in writing. And it goes like this. And I'll explain writing first. Okay, 
So we start with the proper adjective specific. What's the common noun? We'll take our example again, uh, our simple one, Kleenex tissues. Uh, capitalized, specific, representative of only this single product, and as a marker for the company Kimberly Clark. What do we get first? We get ellipsis of this. Ellipsis is the first step. We uh, lose the common class noun phrase, and what we are left with is a proper noun that's still specific. In the beginning, speakers still know that this is a brand name. Okay? They know it's a brand name. It's still capitalized in this in this case, so we'll blend it with it's still clean as. But then, at this point, the native speakers start not realizing it as a brand anymore. They start using it generically. And we start to see this because in writing, what happens? We get a magic screw drop. The magic screw lost. And this results in a common noun. It's generic. So we'll get lowercase the next. I should have used a different one where it doesn't look like a capital K and a small pair the same thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it can be used attributively as an attributive adjective. And if it represents an action, in this case Kleenex does not, but if it represents an action, you'll get it going to the verb as well. Sorry, I wrote that. How did you say Phoenix in the nose? Uh, I don't, but <laughs> potentially. You never know what's going to happen about how many years. Well, absolutely. And this, this was a point that I'll come back to um, in, in just a moment because there was an anomaly in the data in the 100 brand names, and that is exactly the point I'll be making. Um, so if it represents an action, in this case, uh, Kleenex does not I would represent this this way, sort of as a uh, hyphenated arrow. Uh, if it represents an action, it becomes the verb form to Xerox to mace someone and um, and to velcro something. To velcro something, yes. Uh, we can use that in that form. And so this is what we get in right. Yeah, of course. 
my answer tells that I'm using it as a generic form. I don't care what kind of cola you bring me, just bring me something that's fizzy and tastes like cola. Okay? So it's the context that, that does this. And I represented out all of the, um, in every case in the corpus, I showed the exact usage of each of those to show it was being used in a generic sense. And so that's where the context level comes in right here for speaking. Uh, where in writing it's quite clear because we've got the manuscript problem. And we do see some slight variations occasionally. You do, you do occasionally see a generic form where somebody still capitalizes it, and it'll be up here in the chain. Uh, but in general, uh, everything seems to follow this quite, quite well. And as I mentioned, in the corpus, there were 100 brand names that were believed to be generic. Um, I should mention that some of those came from previous research from other scholars, and many of those uh, were done through the two-token test. Uh, and even those that came from previous scholars were two-token tested uh, to make sure that they were, that they uh, need to be generic. And 99 of the 100 brand names, almost perfect, 99 of the 100 brand names followed the pattern perfectly. One day. And this is the, the, oh, is the naughty one. The naughty one was Okay? And sometimes it's hyphenated, and sometimes it's not. Okay? Daiglo is a company that produces um, colors in paint and they're, they're fluorescent neon colors. Okay? Uh, and we have, for example, we have um, I have an example in the corpus of the little girl who's wearing Daglo shoes. Okay. And the problem that we had was that we were missing <coughs> Daglo at this level. In most speech and writing. Okay. We do not have a case, at least I could not find a case of day glow being used as, for example, um, there is a day glow over the city or something like that. Okay, being used as a common noun, demagistalized, and down here. And what you said was very clever. Because how I accounted for this was to revert back to the rules of productivity in language. And the rules of productivity, we know that in noun classes, that it's open-ended and we can continue being productive and adding new forms, right? Well, changing the rule around slightly, just because a form doesn't exist in the language at this point, because the speakers have not gotten around to it yet, doesn't mean that it can't exist. This is the whole concept of acceptability. Uh, would this be an acceptable form if it existed? And it certainly would be. There's nothing wrong with I gave you an, uh, a, an example. It was a day globe in the city. That would be perfectly acceptable. But native speakers at this point in time don't do it. And that was how I accounted for the 100 example. Because it does everything else. It follows the pattern quite nicely. It just goes down here and stops. Okay? And, and jumps. And so we've gotten to that point. And I mentioned earlier to you the case of Google. Google right now is functioning the same way as Daglo. We don't have, at least in English, we don't say, uh, I'm going to do a Google. Okay? I'm going to Google something. It's much more common. Where, again, we make that jump. Okay? So, um, if I found another hundred of these, I would suggest that this is quite normal, that we can get a jump there um, if we're representing the right action. But I haven't found enough examples of that to account for. But once I got past that little uh, problem with um, Dango, and I started thinking about how language works and how language change occurs and how productivity occurs, then it, it becomes quite natural and quite normal again. And that was how I accounted for that. Now, why is all this <laughs> important? Why am I going through all of this? Up in, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, up until this point, everybody had assumed that these were random men. There's nothing random about them. It's, it's quite straightforward, actually. 
But how do the companies feel about this? How do companies feel when they, they see me explaining to them that clear Kleenex and Xerox and Mace and Dayglo are already generic? Well, they get quite upset about that. Um, the first paper that I had written on this appeared in a book called Perspectives on Plagiarism and Intellectual Property in the Postmodern World. Long title. And I wrote a chapter for it, uh, basically outlining, uh, st starting to formulate the theory at that time, and arguing that genericization is actually a good thing because it provides more ammunition for the speaker, okay? More variation, more new forms, and new forms coming into the language, and actually the courts have recognized this. Um, that paper was read by a pretty prominent judge in the appellate court system in America, the one level before the Supreme Court. And it mentioned that, that particular paper that I had written, arguing that there is some benefit to society if these things become a new form comes into the language, primarily. But the companies themselves don't like it. And one morning I got a four o'clock telephone call. I went in Hawaii at four o'clock in the morning, and it was the lawyers for Xerox who had it. Um, I had approached the lawyers, I had approached Xerox for permission to reprint their trademark education ads in that particular paper. And they said, if you proceed with publishing this paper with our trademark education ads in it, we are going to sue you. Well, they didn't sue me. Um, I went around them, I took out their trademark education ad, and I explained it in the text. Okay, this is what the ad says, so we just went around the process. And um, it was a pretty uh, tense couple of days when I was talking to my department about it. Um, but in the end, um, I'm not saying that they should be stripped of their proprietary protection. And actually, the law now does not necessarily strip them of their protection as it did in the past. In the past, brand names such as aspirin in America is a generic. Now, in most countries, it's a generic now. But it's still in Canada and some other ones, you still see buyers. There is the uh, company that owns the, the trademark. And uh, cellophane and some of the others uh, of that time, uh, early 1920s, 30s, 40s, were stripped of their protection. Now today, all companies have to do is create a paper trail, showing that they're making an effort to protect their brand, even if it's just a superficial one. And that's all they have to do. So by calling me and warning me, they're protecting their brand name, and they won't be stripped of it because they'll be able to show in the records that they called Sean Planking on this day and told him, don't do that, okay? So they had some activity there. They have some activity and they create that paper trail and in the end, no one gets sued usually and um, the research continues. I'm purely interested in this on the language level. I'm not interested in trying to um, have Xerox lose their proprietary protection or have um, Mace lose their protection. That's something different. Now, that goes to the point of dictionaries, okay? And I've been quite interested in lexicography and how lexicographers treat generic forms of the brand. And as I mentioned to you, the companies are trying to create that paper trail. So they come after lexicographers and tell them, do not use our name generically. Even though the task of the lexicographer is to represent the language as it's used. And so this, this always creates conflict. And the first time editors and publishers of dictionaries get these letters, they get quite nervous about them. And it, it must bring up some kind of philosophical problem in their head because they know they need to represent the language and they know that that's a form that exists, but we're not allowed to use the form. And what the courts have said is that the form, you, yes, you have proprietary protection, but the form is not taboo. It's not to that level. You cannot protect your brand name to the level of making it so other people cannot use it in speech or in writing. Certainly they can't recreate your product and put Xerox on the product, obviously. But the form itself is not a taboo form. And the courts have recognized that. So, 
Um, my message to lexicographers is please, please put the forms in. Um, we need one dictionary just to stand up and say, enough is enough, these are generic forms. We're going to recognize that. We don't care about the proprietary status of the company behind it. That's for the company and the courts to decide. But as linguists, we must look at language as it exists. As people use it. As people use it. Yes. yes. Normal people. And by limiting that, we're doing a disservice to the people who are actually going to be using our dictionaries. So there would be that side of it. Now, I want to talk about one other little um, aspect of generic forms. And that is what I call type 1 and type 2 changes. Okay? Um, and I need to actually look back at this. I haven't spoken about type 1s and 2s recently. The type 1 changes of the generics, as I have explained to you here. Okay. But there's a type 2 change. And this uh, goes a little bit beyond genericization. Okay. Uh, the type 1 changes, as we saw, are like no, it goes generic, but it only represents sticky tape type stuff. Yeah. We have a type 2 chain, and that's exemplified in, for example, spam. You know what spam is? Yeah. Okay, the hand to ham. Yes. Yeah. That, uh, Second World War, Britain, everybody hated it. They went to America. Yeah, and I did my, my research at Hawaii, which is like, America's biggest spam consumer oh, per capita of oh. spam. So we have spam, and it is a generic. You can use it as a generic for any kind of canned ham in English. But we can also use it, for example, for spam email. Email spam. Yeah, yeah. So we get that semantic extension, right? So we get that other secondary meaning to it that doesn't happen with most regular brand names going generic. And I have a handful of these cases where you have that extension. And so I call these type 2 changes where you get that, that additional meaning being added to it. Okay. So those were the top, uh, two changes. Now, um, where am I going today with this research? Well, it continues. And um, occasionally I see studies coming out where people have looked at this in other languages and I've also done this with Japanese, to take a look at Japanese, how Japanese work. Japanese has a number of uh, brand names which have become generic. Uh, for example, um, Kinchoru, which is a kind of mosquito coil. Um, it has a big rooster on it, and um, that has become generic. Muhi and Makiro, which are kind of for mosquito bites. Something new with mosquitoes in Japan. We have a lot of generic forms. Um, but the most famous example is Hochikisu. Hochikisu was a brand name of stapler, and now Hochikisu is every stapler. It's Hotchkiss, in, in, if we say it in uh, a Western form, it would be Hotchkiss. But um, anytime I ask for a stapler, I ask for Hochikisu. And so we do see this happening in Japan a lot. I see quite a few of really novel brand names in, in Japanese. And let me give you an example of something really interesting. I'm going to draw Japanese for you. Does anyone read Japanese? Chinese? Chinese. Can you read Chinese? What's this character? Well, I don't know that one. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. Okay, all right. Um, in this case, this is pronounced B. B I. So, being. Being. Is a brand name. And I see this on trucks all the time in Sapporo. And it's really kind of clever because the meaning is beautiful. And, but the word is pronounced B, so it becomes like beautiful B for this company. <clears throat> and I've started collecting what I call these, these are hybrid brands, where they're hybrids between Japanese and English, and they take the, the sound and they add it 
to the English sound and create a new form. Okay. So there's that. And I found another one the other day. There's a tea in Japan that comes in big bottles like this that I like very much. It's called oolong tea. And it's Chinese. It's from Fujian province. But in Japan, everybody drinks it and they sit in Japanese. Um, but the company name is San Maria. And they make all kinds of soft drinks. Okay? But their oolong tea is very, very cheap and you get a big bottle for about a dollar. Okay? But the brand is Kore. And then it's Oolong Cha. Charming tea. Okay? Kore is a demonstrative pronoun. It means this. So it's like saying, Sangria, this, registered, tea. I find that really unusual and really quite interesting because I've never seen anyone register something on the closed class before. And out of something that, um, how can you register this? You're going to have people saying, you know, this Walkman. This brand Walkman, and Sangria is going to sue them, <laughs> saying you can't say this Walkman because we have registered this. It almost made me, it almost tempted me to register the <laughs> and say for every use of the you must pay me one yen, oh, just one, just one yen. But I, I I've done uh, about all I can do right now in genericization. I have to wait and see if time will, will decide whether I'm absolutely correct or not. But getting into these forms, no one has looked at these forms so far. Uh, there's another one. Um, I don't think I can remember the character right now for it. But it's, no, and I think it's something like this. But this is pronounced uh, Guri. This is down, of course, but we, in Japanese we would pronounce it as don, and then this is the character for kuri, kuri. And it's pronounced don kuri, no kuri means a form. Okay, so it's another hybrid form where you have the English here, followed by the Japanese. You put the two sounds together and it creates an additional meaning, an additional word. Don kuri, it's the name of a cafe that's on my way to work. Uh, that has just sprung up in the mountains as I'm going through the mountains to the other side to Otaru. And I want to quickly erase that Chinese character because I can't remember how to draw them properly. But uh, people watching the video will be putting comments, you messed up the character. Um, it's not a common character, so you might not be But I'm collecting these forms right now. And I just have a few minutes left before I open up for questions. I want to give you one more uh, very curious example because I've been very interested in name formation and what goes into the name formation. And one example I discovered while riding the Tokyo subway. And it's a very common brand name, but it explains, and it, it can be explained by the, um, what did I call it? The law of unintended consequences. Okay? You know the law of unintended consequences? Despite your best efforts to do something, you can't account for everything that might happen. So, this one I do have an example for. But, 
And often they shorten it down to Muji now, but I was riding the Tokyo subway and I came across this building at some stop, and we had the Muji Yohin characters in big fluorescent lights, as big as me. And, pardon? Which is still branding. Which is still branding. And I was standing there and a friend was with me and we just started laughing because one of the lights had gone out. Oh, the good one. No, no. then the I can't see. No, I can't see. No, I can't see. So instead of unbranded good items, we got not good items. <laughs> so the law of unintended consequences says even if you create the best brand, you can't anticipate everything that's going to happen. And I wish I had had my camera with me to take this picture because it is so lovely as an example. And so I've been, I've been going around and showing this example of you know, what can happen. You might not want to put the knot in your brand name because at some point you might have a light go out. Uh, so let me um, conclude there. We have about 15 or 20 minutes for questions and I'm happy to talk to everybody. But first, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. I really enjoyed it and I hope everything is clear. But if you have a question, please ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.